Hi, everybody. This is Jay Diamond, Head of Thought Leadership for Guggenheim Investments. We recorded this episode of Macro Markets with Scott Minard on Wednesday, December 14th, 2022, exactly one week before Scott's unexpected passing. Scott was a key innovator and thought leader who was instrumental in building Guggenheim Investments into the global business it is today. Please enjoy this episode. We will all miss hearing Scott's thoughts on the market. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Macro Markets with Guggenheim Investments, where we invite leaders from our investment team to offer their analysis of the investment landscape and the economic outlook. I'm Jay Diamond, Head of Thought Leadership for Guggenheim Investments, and I'll be hosting today. We are recording this episode on Wednesday, December 14th, 2022. There's so much going on, and who better to help us make sense of what we're seeing today than Scott Minard, Global Chief Investment Officer for Guggenheim Partners and Chairman of Guggenheim Investments. Now, you can read his full bio on our website, uh, but I just want to highlight perhaps the most relevant data point uh, for Scott uh, for our listeners. Scott is responsible for more than $285 billion in total assets across fixed income, equity, and alternative strategies for our clients. He's also a managing and founding partner of Guggenheim Partners. Welcome, Scott, and thanks for taking the time to chat with us on a very busy Wednesday. Thanks, Jay. It's great to have a chance to talk to all of our friends and clients. Scott, a lot went on today. Uh, we, We had the Fed meeting. We had CPI released yesterday. But... We have to start somewhere, so let's start with policy. Um, in sum, how would you characterize the Fed's posture right now after uh, today's meeting? Well, you know, it's interesting because um, a lot of people in the media seem to be confused with the market's response uh, to what were some fairly hawkish statements, the dot plot, so on and so forth. Um, you know, the Fed had no choice. Um, Since the last meeting, financial conditions have eased quite a bit. Rates have come down, stock prices have rise, credit spreads have tightened. And so uh, any other message than a hawkish message uh, would have been sort of a signal for the markets to take off. And that's the last thing that uh, uh, the committee wants to see right now, because uh, they're still concerned that They haven't really got the inflation genie in the bottle, and they don't want uh, the animal spirits to come back. And so um, no matter what they're really thinking, they had no uh, choice but to to deliver a really hawkish statement. So the Fed's trying to bat down inflation. How do they actually do that using monetary policy tools, and are they effective? I always have to start with the famous uh, axiom of Milton Friedman, which is that uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And, you know, what that means in the simplest terms is when you print too much money, you get inflation. So we've been through a couple of years of uh, hyper money printing during the pandemic. And so the Fed now is faced with the fact that they probably overdid it uh, and that they need to reverse course. <clears throat> I think that the big issue, of course, is how do you know when you become tight enough uh, to, to slow inflation? Uh, and uh, how do you know if you haven't overshot the tight level that you need? And, you know, the Fed is making it more difficult, I think, than it needs to be. They're adjusting the balance sheet simultaneously while raising interest rates. Uh, and that is putting you know, a lot of um, uh, downward pressure on things like money supply uh, and other factors which feed into the real economy with a lagged effect. So um, the committee, I think, was correct uh, at the prior meeting when they decided to say it would be the last 75 basis point increase and that, that in the future, changes in rates would depend on macro conditions. Um, but, uh, you know, at the same time, I'm not so sure that they haven't already gotten to the point where they're overdoing it. And you see it showing up in, in all kinds of data. Uh, you see it in housing. Uh, you see it uh, in um, um, things like uh, consumer activity. 
uh, uh, other sectors of the economy where um, they're not necessarily feeding into the price level, but uh, where it's having a real macro input. I mean, for instance, um, based on our best indicators, we would expect that year over year, holiday sales this year will be up 4% over last year. Sounds like a, you know, a fairly healthy number until you realize that we have to adjust it for inflation. And actually that means that holiday sales are, are negative. So you know, when people ask me, are we in a recession? Um, my answer is, I think yes. Um, the problem is, is that the traditional tools which, which we measured this historically are all being distorted by post-pandemic adjustments. And so uh, when you look through those adjustments, uh, like for instance, the rebuilding of inventories because of the supply chain reopening, uh, and you take those out, we've had no economic growth this year and, and probably a, a contraction in real growth. So, um, you know, I think that uh, economic conditions are a lot worse than the Fed is acknowledging, but uh, there is still a lot of uh, animal spirit in the market and a lot of cash that was sitting on the sideline that is being deployed right now. But once that gets exhausted, I think we're probably going to see lower stock prices and probably lower bond yields eventually. It sounds like you're relatively confident that the Fed is going to bring inflation down, although there's going to be some economic damage along the way. Right. Yeah, I think that, you know, if you read the piece I wrote about this a while ago, the Fed is successfully bringing inflation down, but they're actually probably overdoing it. And so um, having lived through, well, I didn't, but our country has lived through a period like this before uh, in the post-Second World War era. Once the Fed stopped growing the money supply, the uh, inflation rate subsided. And uh, by 1949, we actually had a mild deflation going. Uh, in this case, um, the Fed has taken a more aggressive stance and said, not only are we going to stop growing the money supply, we're going to contract it and we're going to raise interest rates. So um, I think that the inflation genie is not just getting put back into the bottle, but we may find out that um, the cure that we're using for inflation uh, may actually create more damage than what we were thinking when we started this exercise. So before we move to market conditions, um, if you could look into your crystal ball based on this this view of the the macro, uh, what do you think a a possible course for monetary policy is uh, in the next 6 to 12 to 24 months? The whole consensus in our econ research team is that by the time we get into the second half of the year, the Fed will have to start cutting rates. Um, the, the expectation that short-term rates will be at 5.1% um, at the end of 23, um, that uh, inflation will be 3.1%, uh, both of those numbers are probably too high. And so, uh, you know, I would expect that uh, somewhere toward the second half of the year next year, uh, the Fed will find that inflation is receding faster than they think and um, will opt to try to reduce rates. But again, I, I, I'm hesitant only from the standpoint that um, uh, we're not going immediately back to 2%. So it's not entirely clear whether the Fed will actually start reducing rates before we get back to the target rate of 2%. And uh, if that's the case, then um, I think the economic downturn will be even harder than what we currently expect, and unemployment will go up even more. So if the Fed just raised the upper limit at 4.5%, and you say they might not get to 5.1%, which is their long-term view. Well, they may get there, but I don't think they're going to stay stay there. there. Okay. So um, this all begs the question, as and we've talked about it in, in various meetings here internally, how does this all play into credit markets? Uh, credit performance, credit spreads, credit yields. Right. Well, first off, if you look at credit spreads today, 
uh, we are sitting historically at what would be the average spread uh, over U.S. Treasuries. Um, that would argue to be neither underweight nor overweight credit. Um, <clears throat> the likelihood is that if we do get a recession, that we would see a widening in credit spreads, um, in which case I would think that that would be an opportunity to overweight credit. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that widening in credit spreads for like investment grade bonds would probably be against the backdrop of uh, having treasury rates going down. So for people who uh, are just income oriented, you're not really going to likely to take any big capital losses. Uh, you're just not going to have a total return uh, that will match that of U.S. Treasuries. But ultimately, when credit spreads normalize, you'll get all that back. And uh, so, you know, our view is uh, investment grade credit is probably a great place to be. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's very limited downside because it'll be uh, cushioned by falling rates. Um, high yield, different story. Uh, it looks like we have a substantial amount of room to widen there, uh, more than you would pick up on a decline in rates. So, you know, we're in the mode of going underweight in high yield uh, bank loans, credit risk assets, because in a recession, we would expect that uh, the spreads on high yield bonds would probably widen by about uh, 400 basis points, um, as opposed to investment grade bonds, which might widen by 50 or 75 basis points. So clearly the risk reward um, in high yield doesn't uh, look favorable for investors. So Scott, 2022, the story has been a shift upward and, and inversion of the, of the yield curve. Uh, spreads were not at the average uh, spread over treasuries, but at the wider end, uh, higher percentile. So we were buying more of these securities at lower dollar prices, wider spreads, um, and presumably those are doing quite well in our portfolio right now. So t talk to me a little bit about the decision to trade out of those bargains as conditions are changing. How does that work in your mind? Well, I mean, you're right. Uh, we did use the widening and spreads as an opportunity. Um, you know, investment grade corporate bonds got out to the 75th percentile, meaning only 25% of the time or they were cheaper. Um, so that argued to be overweight. Uh, and that's worked really well for us. Uh, our high yield exposure, which has not been dramatically overweight, uh, has been largely focused in bank loans because uh, we felt that uh, as interest rates rose, um, you know, we would get higher income off of the bank loans. Interestingly enough, bank loans are probably the number one performing sector in fixed income this year. So um, <clears throat> that's worked out well for us. But given our view that, you know, of the recession and how much credit spreads would widen from here, um, you know, it, it, we're, we're basically looking just to opportunistically reduce that exposure in particular. There are probably some investment grade bonds that we'll, we'll sell out of. But as I said before, with investment grade credit, it's not really a time to be overweight or underweight. So you know, we're going to maintain what I'll call a neutral exposure there and try to be underweight high yield. Well, you're, you're giving us an advertisement for the benefits of active versus passive management. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I know at, at Guggenheim, we, we, we're, we look across the whole spectrum. We've talked a little bit about investment grade and high yield corporates. Are you seeing anything in structured credit, municipals, uh, any other real estate related securities where you're looking for value right now? Sure. Well, um, uh, munis, especially tax exempt munis, have really performed well. And we buy tax exempt munis even in our taxable accounts uh, when the credit spreads get wide enough um, that you're, you know, basically getting the same sort of yield you'd get on a, a taxable bond. Those securities have performed really, really well. And so, you know, uh, they've become not rich, but not something you would hold in a taxable account at this point. The other parts of the market, it's probably a little too soon to be aggressively looking at real estate yet. Um, uh, CMBS 
um, is probably going to be even more challenged than it is today. Uh, we are on top of it. Uh, we are waiting to see if there is a moment of opportunity there. Uh, but uh, the bottom has not yet been found in commercial real estate. And so I think we can be afford to be patient. Um, CLOs, um, not terribly compelling right now. I mean, they're, they're fair valued, maybe slightly cheap. But when you compare them to other securitized assets, uh, whole business securitization, aircraft, um, these are, are really uh, attractive places to go. Uh, for instance, uh, investment grade aircraft securitization, we purchase bonds today that were yielding 10%. Uh, there's nothing in the investment grade yield world that yields 10%. Uh, whole business, uh, we've been buying securities that are investment grade above 7%. I mean, these are rates that are higher than high yield bonds. And so we're very, very focused there right now. And uh, the, the issue, of course, Jay, is, uh, you know, we manage a lot of money and, you know, trying to get access to large amounts of blocks of paper is very difficult. But, you know, taking a disciplined approach and being in the market every day and being a liquidity provider to that market, uh, you know, we see more than our fair share of the flows. And, and so we're taking advantage of of those opportunities. So I would buy a lot more if we could. Now, you mentioned liquidity. Uh, Year-end always brings some quirks in terms of liquidity, but this year we have the added degree of difficulty of a, a Fed that's aggressive. Um, are you seeing anything that's worrying you on the liquidity front uh, um, in the markets right now? Not really. Um, you know, the... the um, it's been orally. Yeah. The, the repo market is always a place to keep an eye on where Things are getting tough, uh, but because of the Treasury bill paydowns, uh, because of the debt ceiling issues, you know, it's kind of driving more money in that direction at this point. So um, that that should get us through the end of the year. Uh, I'm not overly concerned about liquidity. We're certainly not seeing pressure in in things like commercial paper or, or uh, any instruments like that. So for the time being, uh, I think that getting through the end of the year, it's not going to be a factor. Scott, let me shift it a, a little bit and also go up to the 30,000 foot level and talk a little bit about uh, what you have called the most dominant force in uh, the financial markets today, which is the Federal Reserve. I know you spent a lot of time thinking about the Fed. You advise them uh, in some of their deliberations. Um, do you think that the Fed is behaving appropriately in their role in the markets? It's an interesting question, Jay, because the role of the Fed seems to keep evolving. And so, you know, the idea that they played the role of lender of last resort, uh, responsible for maintaining, you know, stable prices, they, they continue to do those functions. But, you know, in terms of um, the other things which are sitting on their plate, um, you know, dealing with employment, which of course they've been doing since the 1970s, um, but then having to make sure there's financial stability, uh, Congress looking to them to help address climate change and income inequality. Um, the instruments of the Fed are fairly blunt, and I'm not sure that, that the Fed really can successfully take on that many mandates. So I think the Fed is getting stretched in a lot of directions, which it wasn't ever intended to be. But uh, of course, it's also politicized. And uh, you know, having to go up to the Hill um, and explain to the Hill, for instance, that we're, the intention is that we're going to run a restricted monetary policy and induce a recession is something that they can't sell. So it requires them to kind of soft pedal the economic recession story and try to play down the consequences of what they're doing. But, um, you know, I, I in some ways feel sorry for them uh, because they are the only policy tool around. Uh, you know, the fiscal constraints that we operate under uh, don't make it likely that there can be any major fiscal stimulus in the event of a downturn. The fact that we have a divided Congress limits the ability of anything getting through Congress. So the pressure is on. And the pressure is on against that, against the backdrop of 
having you know overshot their inflation target and being subject to criticism about inflation. They have a lot on their plate right now, and uh, um, the possibility that they're going to make a mistake is, is pretty high. What do you think the future holds then for the Fed as an independent body within the government? You basically contradicted yourself uh, <laughs> by using the words the independence of the Fed within the government, right? That's true. Um, so you're, you're right. I mean, it, it is ultimately part of the government. And um, the independence of the Fed is, in my mind, largely an illusion. Uh, it's an illusion that the Fed would like to keep alive. Uh, but the reality is, is that they bow at the will of Congress. Um, and it's nothing new. I mean, you know, in the, in the 70s, uh, you know, the Fed mandate was expanded from price stability to doing price stability and full employment, which has been reinterpreted as maximum. So they are beholden to Congress, and Congress does have the power to change their role. And so it's a fine line they have to walk um, in order to maintain the independence they do have at this point. Right now, I would say um, there is no better solution than the Federal Reserve. And so as the, the pillar of the international financial system, uh, you know, the, the, the Fed plays a very critical role. And honestly, in terms of dealing with at least the Western governments, uh, there's no incentive for anybody to try to push uh, the Fed off of that pedestal. Of course, after we froze assets on Russia and the moves toward uh, creating the BRICS uh, by China, uh, and the willingness of you know countries like Saudi Arabia uh, indicating they'd be willing to participate in this. There is a, a rival financial system or a monetary system that's growing up mm -hmm. around us. Will it gain traction and work? That's yet to be known. Uh, but certainly uh, it won't work in the West. And the history of financial transparency, credibility, and in those nations is questionable. And so um, I'm not overly concerned about it, but uh, certainly uh, there are forces in the world that would like to see the U.S. dollar dethroned as the world's reserve currency. And so uh, I think there will be more and more challenges to it. Before I let you go, Scott, there's still so much we could talk about, uh, but let's just do it in kind of a lightning round format, if you will. Uh, and let's start with the Bank of Japan and how they're executing policy right now. Is this going to end in tears? Uh, I think ultimately, yes. I mean, Dr. Kuroda has gotten uh, a new lease on life now that the dollar's weakening. So he's not under pressure to end his interest rate targeting with JGBs right now. So uh, that, that's going to continue for a while. The concern, of course, with the part of the Japanese is they've had these false dawns before of uh, normal price activity in the economy. And every time that they've tightened, it hasn't worked out very well. So um, th if anything, they're going to overshoot in terms of easing. So at the end of the day, the, the game is nowhere over. You're over in Japan. And if inflation does take hold, then it starts to raise questions about the solvency of the Bank of Japan and how they uh, exercise monetary policy to rein it in. Uh, rain inflation, in, which uh, there are arguments to be made that uh, it could be virtually impossible to rein it in. So uh, uh, the jury's still out, and uh, but it's certainly something to keep an eye on uh, down the road. Okay, when the war in Ukraine broke out, uh, that obviously affected supply chains and commodity availability, and this war has endured. How are you seeing it play out in markets, and what are your thoughts on that? You know, it's interesting. The death of globalization, I think, has been overstated. Um, there is what I'll call a, uh, a re-globalization occurring. And so the West has come up with, uh, you know, some pretty good policies to help offset the impact of the war. Uh, of course, we don't know if the war will escalate. Uh, but for the moment, I think that they have um, the situation as well contained uh, uh, as they could in terms of hitting their 
economy. Um, it'll be interesting this winter to see how cold it gets and if gas prices rise and so on and so forth. But, you know, the recent deal that uh, Germany did with Qatar to expand natural gas production there, uh, Qatar will, you know, within the next two to three years, um, be increasing its gas output dramatically um, and, you know, shipping it into Germany. So the, it's just a realignment of the supply chains and the rebalancing of world power. So uh, I think it, at least for now, uh, as long as the war doesn't escalate in a major way, um, then uh, I think we've got everything pretty well under control. So the midterm elections are over. Uh, we have a split Congress. Um, how do you see a situation like this uh, affecting the markets, if at all? Well, I mean, I think we can rule out um, the prospects that there are going to be any major fiscal uh, policy changes. Um, you know, there, there is no incentive politically for the two parties to get together to pursue either's agenda. Um, now, that if we get into some sort of a, a crisis like the pandemic, then yes, of course, they'll come together and put something together. But the concern people have had about um, policies that are very liberal on the left getting put in place have um, largely not borne out. And uh, the prospects that the conservatives are going to put through a tax cut or, you know, something that uh, is uh, adverse to the liberal view is very remote. Um, it does raise you know, issues around climate change, uh, uh, a transition to sustainable energy, um, things that really do need to get addressed. Uh, I don't think we're going to get important legislation on that. So I would say that, that uh, we're going to be in pretty much a stalemate, uh, which then points back to the Fed. Because if there is any economic downturn, uh, the Fed is going to find itself having to uh, reverse policy and maybe reverse policy harder and faster than it thinks. So um, the, the, the real impact here of um, a divided government is that it puts more pressure on the Fed to try to stimulate the economy and raises issues in the long run about their uh, ability to credibly fight inflation. Last question, Scott. Um, if, if you could leave our, our listeners with one takeaway about what they should be thinking about as investors heading into 2023, what would your advice be to them? Well, I think... Um, Look, uh, it's a lot like the piece I wrote a, a couple of months ago, where you know, I recommended to people, as negative as the world looks, uh, there are a lot of things out there that were cheap, and people should be getting money to work. If you didn't invest in credit assets or, or stocks um, back then, uh, honestly, for the time being, you've probably uh, missed the boat. Um, but you know, bond yields have a long way to fall here. And so I think uh, high quality, longer duration fixed income assets are a great place to go. I, I've mentioned you know, some of the securitized assets that are really attractive, which we invest in in our funds. They're, I think, really a great opportunity for income with very little volatility or downside. Stocks with a mild recession next year, uh, we should probably expect S&P earnings to drop 10% from $220 to $200. Uh, historically, in a recession, the, the multiple goes to 15. Uh, so that would put stocks around 3,000 to the S&P. Be more generous and say we go to 16, then we'll be at 3,200. You know, whether you want to take even the upside case, we're, far, we're pretty far away. So stocks probably have 10 to 20 percent of downside from here, and uh, I would probably avoid the owning stocks. One thing to remember about uh, equities, and that is that uh, uh, the stock market has never entered a bull market while the Fed is still raising interest rates. So uh, even though we've had a great seasonal rally, uh, you know, Santa Claus is coming to town, right? Um, the reality is that uh, I think this is a seasonal rally. I think uh, the, the fact that it was so quick uh, was uh, 
mostly a result of the fact that people were underinvested and they, they put money to work fast. And I think a lot of that money will get absorbed over the coming month or two, or maybe into March of next year. And, uh, you know, at that point, uh, economic pressures will come to bear, earnings will start to fall, and, and we should probably see stocks meaningfully lower later in, in 2023. So, Scott, uh, thank you again for your time. Really appreciate you being here. Is there any final message you have for our listeners who've tuned in today? Well, you know, first off, Jay, I never like to um, let the opportunity pass to thank our clients, the people who have confidence in us and trust us with um, the, the funds uh, that they're responsible for. And we always appreciate their loyalty and commitment to us. It does not go unnoticed. And uh, so for you guys out there who are paying the bills, I really appreciate it. Thank you. I would uh, like to wish you all a happy Christmas and a Merry Hanukkah. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll all have a prosperous and healthy New Year. Well, Merry Christmas to you, Scott. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, and thanks to all of you uh, who have joined us for our podcast. Now, before we go, I just want to remind our listeners that if any of you have a question for Scott or any of our other podcast guests, please send them to macromarkets at guggenheiminvestments.com, and we will do our best to answer them either on a future episode or offline. Now, if you like what you're hearing on Macro Markets, please rate us five stars. I'm Jay Diamond, and we look forward to gathering again in 2023 uh, for the next episode of Macro Markets with Guggenheim Investments. In the meantime, for more of our thought leadership, uh, including some of the pieces that Scott mentioned today, uh, visit GuggenheimInvestments.com slash perspectives. So long. Important notices and disclosures. One basis point is equal to 0.01%. Investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principal. Stock markets can be volatile. Investments in securities of small and medium capitalization companies may involve greater risk of loss and more abrupt fluctuations in market price than investments in larger companies. The market value of fixed income securities will change in response to interest rate changes and market conditions, among other things. Investments in fixed income instruments are subject to the possibility that interest rates could rise, causing their value to decline. High yield securities present more liquidity and credit risk than investment grade bonds and may be subject to greater volatility. Investors in asset backed securities or ABS, including mortgage backed securities or MBS and collateralized loan obligations or CLOs, generally receive payments that are part interest and part return of principal. These payments may vary based on the rate loans are repaid. Some asset backed securities may have structures that make their reaction to interest rates and other factors difficult to predict making their prices volatile, and are subject to liquidity and valuation risk. CLOs bear similar risk to investing in loans directly, such as credit, interest rate, counterparty, prepayment, liquidity and valuation risks. Loans are often below investment grade, may be unrated, and typically offer a fixed or floating interest rate. This podcast is distributed or presented for informational or educational purposes only and should not be considered a recommendation of any particular security, strategy or investment product or as investing advice of any kind. This material is not provided in a fiduciary capacity, may not be relied upon for or in connection with the making of investment decisions and does not constitute a solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. The content contained herein is not intended to be and should not be construed as legal or tax advice and or a legal opinion. Always consult a financial tax and or legal professional regarding your specific situation. The opinions contained herein are subject to change without notice. Forward-looking statements, estimates and certain information contained herein are based upon proprietary and non-proprietary research and other sources. Information contained herein has been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but are not assured as to accuracy. No part of this material may be reproduced or referred to in any form without express written permission of Guggenheim Partners LLC. There is neither representation nor warranty as to the current accuracy of nor liability for decisions based on such information. Past performance is not indicative of future results.